Hey, got a few friends with me here. Uh, this old doll, which I will put here, I'll come back to him later on. Uh, let's see if we can stand there on his own. Yeah, he can, very good. Right, um, I decided to um, have a title of this talk as Digital Disruption. And um, if we look around ourselves today, just the fact that we are here, uh, we know about TED, we have gathered here, wouldn't have happened um, 10 years ago. Something has changed. Uh, and I would today talk to you about how our entire society has basically been turned upside down and around many times by digital uh, technology. And I would like to start by telling you a brief story but a Swedish musician who um, was one of the uh, most famous ones back in the late 1970s, early 1980s. His name was Per Gessle. He had a band called Julene Tider in Swedish. And it was, it was kind of boy band, really famous in those days. And by 1983, 1984, no one knew about Per Gessle. People had forgotten about him, and those who knew about him felt sorry for him because he was a nobody. And uh, a decade later, he had sold about 45 million albums, 25 million singles. Something happened in the meantime. What actually happened was that he learned how to use synthesizers, uh, drumming machines, midis, production techniques. Because back then, if you wanted to do really good music, you needed access to the best studios in the United States. But all of a sudden, with all this new technology, you could do that in Sweden. You could do it anywhere. Per Gessle understood that. He founded Roxette with Marie Fredriksson, and the rest is history. He saw an opportunity, and he managed to capitalize upon it. And uh, this is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, in the world, we have 10, and then followed by 19 series. That's 10 quintillion transistors. A transistor is a building block um, of basically the information society. And if you put those together, you can get a computer, a mobile phone, which is switched off, by the way. Um, and that's quite a huge number. How big is it? Well, that's what you produce each year today, 10 quintillion transistors. And you have about 10 and then 16 zeros. That's roughly the amount of ants on this planet. So it means basically that each and every ant on this planet could own their own computer. <laughs> and to top it off, each and every of those transistors can, you know, they, they go from one mode to another one. That's how they store information. And they can switch back and forth 1.5 trillion times in a second. How much is that? Well, if I would turn a switch on and off 1.5 trillion times, it would take me 25,000 years. So we're storing quite some information here. And Per Gessle, Roxette, they managed to capitalize upon that. They saw it as an opportunity, and that put them on a joyride for a decade way beyond what they could have imagined. And um, now I would like to take another example, speaking of how this turns society upside down. So let's go to uh, outside of Stockholm, um, to a, a site in a quite prosperous industrial uh, suburb, uh, where there is a building which is kind of, uh, it doesn't look too inviting, I would say. Uh, we move up closer. Uh, welcome to the main entrance. Not open on a Sunday, it seems. 
Ah, it isn't open on a Sunday. This place is destroyed, basically. Um, but it has been subject to some creativity as well, you could say. If you look carefully there, you see a couple of letters together saying Kodak. This was a place where Kodak used to uh, develop film. And, well, they don't anymore, right? Um, someone there summarized what happened to Kodak. Pang. Someone else summarized this. A Kodak moment. Kodak used to make money on each Kodak moment because they made their money on film. And they got into some trouble, you could say. This is what it looks like. This is digital technology. We burn you all. <laughs> Let's go back in time, about 30, 40 years, and to a small town called Otvidaberg in Sweden. And there used to be a company there, a prosperous, a very famous company called Fawcett, manufacturing mechanical calculators. And um, it was huge. It was all over the world. The whole world is using fa Fawcett. In the New York skyscrapers, in the mines of Rhodesia, everywhere. This was a very admired company in Sweden. And here is this uh, Fawcett man, the uh, mascot that the company had all over the place on fairs and just to get some PR for the company. Put in various positions as a way to get marketing. <laughs> and, well, as we know nowadays, calculators are electronic. And uh, that created quite a, some difficulties for Fawcett because what they knew was mechanics, right? And here we see an electronic calculator from the early 1960s and one from the early 1970s. You see how much smaller it is. It became smaller, cheaper over time, and all of a sudden Fawcett was in, in quite some serious trouble. And uh, here is, I took a photo of this using a digital camera, um, of this is top management meeting, and those are the minutes from that meeting. So a company with about 10,000 employees around the world, and uh, I'll read a small paragraph to you in English. We sit out here in the forest, and we don't have a clue what's going on in the world. Now, can you imagine that? A couple of directors of a large, admired company, and one of them is basically saying, guys, come on, face it, it's game over. And this is quite an accurate description of what, what happened. Another engineer said that the cogwheels in the mechanical calculators, that was the soul of the company. And that soul lost its entire value with the shift to electronics. And, of course, the society of Otvida Berg was also puzzled and suffered tremendously from this shift. This headline says, they can kill two towns by laying off all these people. In this society, it ain't the church which in, is in the middle of town, it's Fawcett. The Fawcett crisis emerged in 1971-72 and put many of those minor, small societies around Sweden in quite a lot of trouble. And, uh, well, a couple of hungry machines came and had a good meal here. The future didn't end up the way that Fawcett had expected it would do. Let's go back to Kodak. Now we're in Rochester, New York, where about 60,000 people used to work for Kodak. And uh, Kodak, in the 1980s, had about 140,000 employees all around the world. It's a gigantic company. And, uh, I mean, if you go to YouTube, 
and type codec demolition, you can see videos of buildings being demolished, former film manufacturing plants. People using their digital cameras, their camcorders to record the event. I think the digital disruption cannot be illustrated in a better way. This is, it's creative destruction. We destroy the established structures by introducing new things in society. And digital technology has done it. Now, look at those images, those structures you had, the sales organization, the manufacturing plants. It's all lost its value. And these are not exceptions. This is a general pattern we have seen ever since the 1960s. Polaroid went bankrupt with a shift to digital imaging. Swedish legendary company Hasselblad suffered tremendously. Cogwheels lost their value. Radio manufacturers suffered back in the 50s, 60s. Typewriter manufacturers suffered when you introduced personal computers. The Swiss watch industry almost collapsed in the 1970s, 80s, when watches became electronic. Telephones, those old fat screens, not to mention the music industry. Finance, you trade stocks over the internet nowadays. And it doesn't stop there. Electronics has also turned the political structures in society upside down or obsolete, really. Just to give one example, TV, digital satellite communication, distorted the Swedish TV monopoly back in the 1980s. Digital money flows over all boundaries all around the world. No regulations of that. The gambling monopoly today, we have a gambling monopoly on a paper. On a sheet of paper, we have it. In reality, Pokestars, Betson, you name it. It's not a monopoly anymore. And it's been removed by technology. Now, we can like this or not. I think it is. It's like gravity. Are you for or against gravity? Would you vote for or against gravity? It's pointless. It is. This is what society looks like, and this is a historical trend ever since the 1960s that electronics is destroying established structures in society. Industries are transformed, turned upside down, and we better face this and cope with it somehow. Now, here's a small quote, which I will read to you. Electronic techniques would continue to displace other modes of control, reaching into nearly all aspects of our lives. The interesting thing is that this was said in 1977 by Intel's co-founder, a man named Robert Noyce. He said this, and he said it in 1977, and it's frightening how accurate it turned out to be. And therefore, I suggest by thinking like this, we can look ahead, we can look into the future and try to figure out what's going to happen. So what will happen? Well, Video surveillance, for one thing, is going to be distorted and removed in the same way as happened with digital cameras. We're going to see how the gaming industry becomes more and more important in professional life. We're going to see newspapers encountering more and more problems. We already know that they do, right? Books becoming electronic. And who knows, the publishing industry, are they up for the same fate as this Kodak company? Maybe. Now, ads used to be distortions, an interruption. That's not the case anymore. Nowadays, 
companies are fighting for our attention on YouTube. Have you seen this one? Where they make a piano out of the stairs and people go and try to climb it up and, and it becomes music out of it. And the most fascinating thing with this clip on YouTube is that on the end there's a logo with Volkswagen, right? They use it as a way to market themselves. It's pretty interesting. And now I'm talking about it here, so it's obviously pretty good marketing, right? <laughs> I would say that given all this, the future belongs to those who embrace this digital revolution and try to capitalize upon it the way Per Gessler did back in the 1980s. Robert, Robert Murdoch said once, Big will not beat small anymore. It will be fast, beating slow. Here's another quote from Robert Noyce saying, it has often been said that just as the Industrial Revolution enabled man to apply and control greater physical power than his own muscle could provide, so electronics has extended his intellectual power. And this is exactly what has happened. We have access to the cameras, we have access to the internet, we have access to MP3 players. Every, everywhere we have information nowadays. And the consequence of that is the rise of amateurs. Amateurs start to dominate society now. The Arctic Monkeys was a group which launched the um, record that was the debit record with the highest sales ever in British history. They gave out CDs during their concerts. People put it up online, created fan sites and so on, and it went viral. This woman has more web hits on Google than, her, uh, the, than the Minister of Trade. In a world where Facebook is one of the largest countries on Earth, if, if it would be in a country, this man has had 6.9 million supporters online, and that's pretty remarkable. You think that made a difference during the election? I think it did. So, what's going to be there for us? If all this is for free and everyone can be an amateur, you get the cameras, you get everything, you get the camcorders, I suggest what is left is a message. The message is what differentiates. If you're an amateur, if you're a company, that's it. And if you have a message and you use all these tools, you're going to be on the winning side, not the losing side. You'll be on a joyride. <laughs> Thank you.